My wife tells me I've got pediatric shoes, I've got blood pressure medicine, I gotta wear glasses. She says she's already married to an old man. <laughs> so good to be here and to see you, brethren, in the great state of Tennessee. I'm looking forward with anticipation to the week that lies ahead of us. Some good Bible lessons have been prepared, and I begin to start with one right now. So without further ado, I want you to take out your Bibles and refresh your memory in Galatians chapter 1, the passage that was read earlier. Before we read that, I would like for you to understand that sometimes I like to use historical scenarios, historical stories to really introduce and to emphasize the biblical principles by which you and I will be taking a look at here in the next couple of moments. It was in 49 B.C. 49 B.C., 60 years before Jesus Christ would walk upon this earth as a man. 49 B.C., a very prominent man by the name of Julius Caesar. He has been a general. He has been a governor for the Roman Empire. He had, by his own initiative, invaded Gaul, which we now call France. He has placed those tribes into submission. And while he had conquest after conquest after conquest, victory after victory, his fame growing, those in Rome looked on with jealousy. They look on with jealousy. Men by the name of uh, that you recognize, like Pompey and others, look on and they seek to stymie Julius Caesar. They want to halt him. They don't like his affluence. They don't like his, uh, uh, his power, his wealth. And so what they do is through a series of bold maneuvers, they oust Julius Caesar and lay a set of demands upon him. Come to Rome to face trial or else. And so, on this fateful day, Julius Caesar finds himself at the head of his legions, and they are resting upon the opposite banks of the Rubicon River. And he knows, he knows that the Rubicon has a special significance for the Italians. He knows that it is the borders of the inner heartland of Italy. And he knows that though the empire stretches many miles beyond that river is a dividing line. It is the drawing point in the sand. That no army is allowed to march over the Rubicon into the heart of Italy itself. If one does, they are considered enemies of Rome and they will be killed. And so Julius Caesar sets upon the banks of the Rubicon River knowing the decision that lies before him. Does he march with his armies to Rome for justice and for the preservation of his life and all that he now possesses and has? Or does he march across the Rubicon by himself to face judgment in Jerusalem in certain death? He stays up all night. And the various historians record that upon the next morning with the command of advance, at the head of his columns, he steps forward, leading his legions across the Rubicon River. And he says the fateful words in Latin, Alea Inca Est. The die is cast. There is no return. There is no going back. Now, the decision has been made. It is irrevocable. And he will face the decisions come what may. Alea Inca Est. And so that uh, that episode in history really uh, serves to introduce uh, the idea of choices and decisions in, in this life, the decisions that we make. And we realize that there are many points of no return, aren't there? There are certain times in our lives in which we cannot go back. There are certain decisions that we make that are irrevocable. There are certain dire consequences that must be faced and there are nothing. there is nothing that we can do about it. And so the words, the die is cast, serve to remind us all of a biblical principle that pervades and prevails in many aspects and areas of our lives. There are points of no return. And so this morning, I want to contemplate with, it, with you together life, the seriousness of life, the decisions that we make in life, and what you and I need to teach, preach, not only here in the assembly, but to our own family things that are being lost. 
And so there are certain points that we come to. Sometimes we come to them by no fault of our own. We simply just get older, don't we? We simply get older. And I'm talking about the innocence of youth here. The innocence of youth. You and I know and appreciate passages like 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4 in which the Bible relates what sin is. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is the transgression of God's law. When one violates or ignores or refuses to obey what God has revealed, then it is called sin. It is called sin. It is something that is laid at the feet of every individual. Isn't it? And yet we also realize that there is a point in time in life, very early, very early, where there is something called the innocence of youth. There was a point in time in which everybody in this room and anybody that's ever existed was too young to know the difference. They could not comprehend. Intellectually, they could not fathom uh, the degree of responsibility that has been placed on their shoulders by God. They could not fathom uh, uh, eternity. They cannot fathom hell. They cannot fathom heaven. You cannot teach a four-year-old certain things. You cannot do it. If I were to uh, teach my four-year-old, if I were to come along and he reaches up and he slaps his sister, his two-year-old sister, well, Jamie, Brother Wiggins would take corrective action. Alright? But it would be a little bit different than if he was 18 and he reached up and he slapped his sister. You see what I'm saying? There is something in the Bible that we oftentimes refer to uh, as the age of accountability. The age of accountability. <clears throat> that phrase is not found in the Bible. That is a phrase like the Trinity or omniscience. Words that we have coined to describe principles or ideas that are found within the Bible. The age of accountability simply refers to the point in time in which you have come out of that age of innocence. There was a time, yes, early in your life, in which uh, God knows and allows and has revealed the innocence of you. But everybody hits a certain time in their own maturity, in their own way, in which they know. They know. And that innocence is gone. That innocence is gone. And guess what? You never, ever, ever get it back. You never get it back. You passed that Rubicon a long time ago. Some of us longer than others. Oh, that was a joke. Y'all laughed. That was a joke. The age of accountability. The age of accountability. And brethren, we need to understand that your precious baby, your precious boy, your precious girl, your grandchildren, whoever it is that you have, and whoever that you place on a pedestal and you love, are going to be held accountable by God. And you can make all the excuses that you want for their sinful and wicked behavior now, but God will call them into judgment. And brethren, that emphasizes the role uh, I have as a parent the role that I hopefully will have one day as a grandparent, and the role I have as a New Testament Christian and a gospel preacher to remind us of these things. Our responsibility before God. Other times there are, there are things that happen and they pertain to decisions. Decisions that you make. Decisions that people like Julius Caesar have made before us long ago. Decisions in which uh, uh, they, they come to us, whether it is by life or whether it is the pattern of life that we may have chosen. Sometimes life throws things at us. Uh, there are things that people do, decisions that they make that have terrible consequences. I'm thinking about uh, suicide. Suicide. I'm thinking about uh, the, the idea that people get so mentally distraught. Uh, depression can occur. Uh, they, they feel overwhelmed that they, they cannot... Uh, receive help, and if somebody does try to reach out and to give them help, it is not the sort of help that they need, or maybe that they are embarrassed for their problems to come out into the open. And a whole myriad of uh, excuses can be offered, and sadly, many times people hide it in the closet until when they take their life. They take their life, they make that decision, that choice, in which it cannot come back from. In 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge was built. Any of y'all remember that? No. 1937. And you can go and you can look at pictures 
at the various stages of construction. Since 1937, over 1,200 people have walked up to the bridge and taken that 220-foot plunge over the side into the waters below to commit suicide. 1,200 people. Of those 1,200 people, only 13 have survived. Only 13. Of those 13, the latest and most recent, he said this. He said, there I stood on the edge of the Golden Gate Bridge. There were cops, there were medical personnel, I even had friends begging, urging me not to do what I knew I was fixing to do. And as I turned loose and felt my body start that fall, he said, I knew immediately it was the worst mistake I'd ever made in my life. Amen. And it could not be undone. To this day, he sits in a wheelchair at Airport. Such is sad, such is tragic. But brethren, we've got to teach our children, we've got to teach our young people that there are responsibilities placed upon us. There are repercussions for your actions. You are held responsible <clears throat> in this world and in the next. And we got to teach our children. we got to remind ourselves on a daily basis that there are decisions that you and I are capable of making at any second. And yet it is so, so easy, isn't it? With the pull of a trigger. With the jerk of a steering wheel. With the prick of a needle. With a word said in anger. It is so easy to mess your life up. You can mess your life up and it can never be hurt. Never be true. How sad. How tragically sad. And we have those that continue to compound their problems. They have made bad decisions. And yet, uh, even though these decisions are bad, they compound their problems with further evil work. I'm thinking about abortion. I'm thinking about abortion. You were happy, were you not, when you heard that they had rescinded uh, Roe versus Wade? Amen. You were happy? Abortion is not over. Abortion is not over. It's not over. Over the half of this country, sadly, will still continue to practice. On the Vietnam Wall, the Vietnam Memorial, you know how many names are on the Vietnam Wall? 58,000. 58,000 American lives that lost their years in roughly 11 years war. We kill that many unborn babies every 11 days. Hmm? Hmm? And it's just now, just now coming out, those that have, those poor women that have been influenced, those poor women that have lived sexually promiscuous lives, those poor women that have uh, uh, become pregnant with a child and now that it is unwanted, they compound their error. Physically and psychologically and spiritually by committing murder. How sad is that? How sad is that? <clears throat> we need to teach our children about another milestone. I teach my kids that there are two defining moments in one's life. Two decisions that matter, uh, I would say, more than any of the others. The first is the time in which you uh, obey the gospel. That would be number one. Do you know what number two is? Who you decide to marry. Who you decide to marry. And we need to teach our children God's divine design on marriage. On marriage. And I'll be speaking about this more in depth tomorrow night. As uh, we look around and we see all the various movements that are raging around us and the open homosexuality and so on and so forth. But we need to teach our children what the Bible has to say. I had a young girl in my office uh, not long ago and she said uh, something like this to me. She says, you know, said, uh, I'll probably go to college and I'll, uh, I'll do all these things. And uh, I'll be... Uh, I imagine I'll get married. I imagine I'll get married uh, to a wonderful, loving husband. She had it all planned out. But just like so many gospel preachers before and even uh, New Testament Christians, she then quickly uh, uh, said this, in the presence of her own mother. In the presence of her own mother. And she says, well, and probably get divorced. Now we need to teach our children.
children what Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4 says. That marriage is to be held in honor amongst all men. All men. Not just if you're a New Testament Christian. That's not only when the rules of marriage apply. Not just if you live in the United States. Not just if you have a job. Not just if you're white. Not just if you're a certain social status. Not just if you live in the 21st century. But from Genesis chapter 2 and 3, God set for humanity the universal rule on marriage. And whether you believe in God or not, you are held to that standard. You are held to that standard. And sadly, so many people do not understand the seriousness of marriage. They do not understand the design of marriage. They do not understand who they're even supposed to be married to nowadays. They do not understand the drastic consequences of entering into that union before God and then deciding to break it later. Brethren, that is called adultery. That is called adultery. And amongst those that will be found in the depths of hell is the adultery. One man for one woman for life. That's what the Bible teaches. And brethren, that's what you and I have got to believe. That's what you got and I got to believe. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and in verse number 38, God is going to judge. Is going to judge those that have broken wedlock. And you and I know and understand that the baptismal waters, the baptistry that's right here behind me, the water that's in it, and what it symbolizes. And one can be immersed for the remission of their sin. They're buried with Christ in baptism. Right? To the working of God. That's what the Bible teaches. And uh, just as Jesus was buried in the tomb, so we're buried in the baptismal water. And as He raised up out of the tomb, so we're raised to walk in newness of life. The baptismal waters wash away your sins. But they don't wash away your marriage history. If you are an adulterer, you are an adulterer. And though you can be forgiven for it, never again, once you have violated God's laws on marriage, never again do you enter into another marriage. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible teaches. Brethren, that's what we've got to believe. We've got to believe God's standard on marriage. We've got to believe God's standard on morality. We've got to believe that there are certain points in time that you and I can make decisions that can never be reversed. I'm thinking about that passage that we read in Galatians chapter 1, 13 through 16. The reason why I had uh, I had it read was for the simple demonstration that there are people who have made a decision as it pertains to God. They made a decision. Uh, they they weighed their choices. They considered the information that was available. Uh, maybe they sit and they've heard the preacher. Maybe their mother and father have droned on about it until they're sick of it. Maybe every time they go over to Grandma's house, she mentions it every time. Maybe they see the Bible sitting on the, on the, on the sofa. Or maybe they see it sitting on the, on the coffee table. They know. They know. And yet they make the decision, just like so many others have, to reject God. And one of the powerful things about Galatians chapter 1 is the Apostle Paul uses his own personal testimony. How powerful is that? And uh, he says this. He says, you know, there was a point in time in which I was about as wicked as wicked could get. I, I continually uh, amaze myself at the lengths that I would go in order to persecute the church, in order to stand opposed to all the things that New Testament Christianity stands for. That was me, Paul says. But, what happened? He made a choice. He made a decision. Sadly, brethren, there are people who reject God. They reject God. And not only is this an initial rejection, they reject Him continually. Continually. Again and again and again and again and again. They reject God. They spurn every invitation. They spurn every opportunity to reject God. And friends, when that decision is made and it is not deviated from, it leads one to hell. It leads one to hell. Tears have been cried in my presence about loved ones that have gone. Parents, grandparents, and there is nothing that the child can do. Nothing. And I know and realize and appreciate that there have been religions in the world that have capitalized upon this. Haven't they? But that is not what God has. I also realize 
that there is no other name under heaven given amongst men by which man can be saved. There's not going to be another prophet. There's not going to be another Messiah. He has already come. He has already come. And if you don't believe in the one that God sent, then there is no other. That is not arrogance. That is true. It is true. But you and I realize that. And that ought to motivate us, especially this week. Gospel meetings are designed to be evangelistic efforts. Right? I realize that bringing friends and loved ones and members of the community to the, to the church building isn't all. So much more must be done. But it's a start. And it's a good one. Make that decision this week. And then again, I'm, I'm reminded of other things. I'm, I'm reminded of a medical term. Y'all ready for this? Cardiosclerosis. You know what cardiosclerosis is, Jamie? Now, Jamie, I have to tell you, I have heard of sugar baby. I have heard of sweet sugar, but I've never heard of a sugar doctor. You need to ask him what cardiosclerosis is. Well, the hardening of the heart. The hardening of the heart. Sometimes hearts become hard. Remember in Mark chapter 16, Jesus has risen. He is now with His disciples. And in verse number 14, He chastises them for not believing in the, in the testimony of those that saw Him risen. And he, he tells them that they did so. They rejected the testimony because they had hard hearts. You remember in Romans, uh, the book of Romans, it will be in Romans chapter 11 and verse number 7. Romans chapter 11, verse number 25. The Apostle Paul is lamenting the fact that his own countrymen, his own Jews, his own people have rejected God and he says twice there that they have done so with their hard hearts. The Apostle Paul is going to write to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse number 18 and 19, speaking of the pagans of the day. Speaking of... Uh, uh, to the church in Ephesus who is right dead center in the midst of all the, the paganistic worship, in the midst of all their rituals, in the midst of their temples. And uh, speaking of those pagans of the day, he relates uh, that they would not believe. Would not believe. The Jews. Notice John. He says this about the Jews in John chapter 12. He says in verse number 37, he said they did not believe. And in verse number 39 of John 12, he said they could not believe. They could not believe. Why? It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. We take a lot of medicine for our heart, don't we? We keep our blood thin. We, we uh, have do exercise. We, we have stents put in. Sometimes we'll have open heart surgery. We're not talking about the physical heart here, are we? We're not talking about the muscle that pumps blood. We're talking about the seat of intellect and emotion. And that has been closed off. It has been walled off again. And sometimes, there's no reason. There's no reason. I had a grandmother. We had four children. Two boys and two girls. And all growing up, I knew that my Aunt Lord was not a member of the church. I knew it. Uh, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I, I kind of felt like maybe you could tell it just by the interactions we had as a family. It was something that was unsaid. You, know. you notice these things. And though it never impacted our relationship with them, loved them dearly, but uh, you could tell. And it was always on the back of your mind. My grandmother tried for 30 years. 30 years. Can you believe it? And my Aunt Lori and my Uncle Chuck remained stone solid. And one day coming home from work, Austin comes to the building, got to baptize your aunt. Think tears were cried that day. Oh yeah. But sadly, that moment never comes for some people. Mark, records in Mark chapter 3 and verse number 29 the words of Jesus Christ, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He said this is the eternal sin. It's eternal. It has eternal consequences. 
and the, the terror of hell is not going to be the darkness so, so much. It's not going to be just the pain. It's not going to be just the heat. You know what it'll be? It'll be an eternity in remembering and acknowledging a life spent wasted. And sadly, too many are not going to realize that until they stand for God. Brother, I'm here to tell you something right now. Judgment Day is going to be a happy day only to the faith. Only to the faith. Not for a majority of people. The hardness of the heart. Paul says this. He says, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed. Who can finish it? Receiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seated with heart. The nerve endings are gone. They cannot feel. They are impregnant. And then finally, let me close with this thought. Brethren, we've talked about morality. We've talked about decisions in this line. We've talked about the age of accountability. We've talked about marriage. We've talked about rejecting God, rejecting the truth. And finally, one last point of no return. One last rubricon. One last river that we must all cross. Oftentimes, we use that, don't we? Crossing the Jordan River. Yonder over the rolling river. We sing that song. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about life after death. Crossing the Jordan into a new land, just like the Israelites did. We talk about that. And yet, Jesus told a parable about, the, the, uh, about those that were to keep their lamps ready. The virgins. And there was a portion of the virgins that were unprepared. And they, they got up, they got up late. And they went and they beat on the door. The door is It is appointed unto man. And after this, the judges. And I don't care how many times your brother, your sister, your mother, your friend is baptized in your behalf. I don't care how much money is put in the collection plate. I don't care how many prayers are prayed. God has been very clear on this subject. And it is a source of pain and a source of regret for many, even in my own family, as I reflect upon those that have went to eternity alone. And yet, that does not diminish the fact that the same choice that was thrown at their feet is now laid at mine. And what will I do? Brethren, that's the lesson. That's the lesson. And it should make us aware of life, our responsibilities in this life, and many of the problems that we see in the world today, especially in this country, I am convinced it, it, they are brought about, at least in large part, by people who do not want the responsibility of their actions. But that is not the way God is. And so let us be aware and let us know the seriousness of God's law and let us have the mindset that whatever we say, do, and think, everything that we do in this life will be geared for the preparation of the next. That we can stand before God with our all assurance that we can possibly muster. We've got everything in our power to stand justified in this. Do you need to respond? The invitation will be given many times this week. I'll be giving it every night. This is not new. How many invitations have you set through? Hundreds? Thousands? Three, four times a week for how many years? And yet, the power of the message of the cross of Jesus Christ should never be diminished. It is the greatest story ever told. It is the story that binds us all here together. Our belief in God, our belief in the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed for you and me. That is the story that unites us and that is our common cause. And let us reflect upon it 
as the invitation is offered. What decisions have you made this past week? Have you lived a life that is outside of the body of Christ? You need to render obedience to God. Have you lived a life in secret or maybe blatantly and openly that brings shame and reproach upon the church and upon our Savior who found it? Let us assist you as you make the decision here and now to right those wrongs. We're here for you in love. We're here for you in spirit. Spirit, but we're here for you in all earnest. Come forward. Come forward now. Let's stand and sit. Why did Jesus wait?